Hey, it's Paul, and thank you for joining me today. Today, we're going to talk about the sell side of M&A, which is really at the core of what we do. And before we get started, I wanted to send a sincere thank you out to Ron Hodgkins, Bello Pest. Ron, the Opus X you sent me, I appreciate it. It's fantastic. And once again, we find ourselves at Monte Cristo here in Old San Juan. You know, having run deals for the last 20 years, the extreme majority of them being on the sell side, I've, I've come to realize um, that there's a lot of things that a typical business owner doesn't know getting into a process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about you know the mindset of a seller and how to think about a formal sell side process. What you're effectively trying to do when you take a company to market, you know, a lot of owners think, okay, I've got a business, there's buyers out there, I'm gonna negotiate one-on-one -on -one with them, come up with a price, strike a deal. But the most effective deal makers on the planet are negotiating two things simultaneously. One is process, the other is substance. So the process by which the business is sold is extremely important, as well as the substance. And what I mean by substance is terms, price, so on and so forth. If you think about negotiations, you know, I think probably the most difficult person on the planet to negotiate with is a crazy person, right? I mean, saying crazy things, doing crazy things, being entirely irrational. Another very difficult person to negotiate with is a bumbling idiot that really just has no idea what the hell's going on. But if I think about a third classification of very, very difficult people to negotiate with, it is children. You know, if you think about, you know, an eight-year-old negotiating with his parents, I mean, children always have extremely high aspirations, right? I mean, they always shoot for the moon. They understand the decision-making structure within the family union. You know, they know what to go to mom for, what to go to dad for, what to go to their brother and sister for. So they know the incentive structures within the family unit, and they understand how decision-making is made. Um, the other thing about children is, you know, if you sit there and watch them negotiating, for them, no is just an opening bargaining position, right? It's just something to be ignored and rolled right past. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I think on the sell side, you want to negotiate like a child and not really come into any sort of a bargaining situation with preconceived notions. I think the most important thing a seller can do is take a step back and say, okay, I have a business, I have an asset, and there are likely to be multiple acquirers for that asset. I think a dangerous thing to do, and although valuation is extremely important, you know, sellers oftentimes when they come to us really like to spend a lot of time focusing on what the business would likely sell for. And while valuation is obviously an extremely important aspect of what we do, it's oftentimes really difficult to, to understand at the front end of the process precisely what the business would sell for. And so my advice to folks is spend the time trying to understand value, but be like a child. I have very, very, very high aspirations. Once you kind of frame up the value, once you understand what it is that you want to get out of the transaction, then you have to design a sell side process that's very specific to that unique asset. And there, there are literally thousands of different ways to run a process and sell a business. And many of these businesses are unique. And today we're going to talk a little bit about, I think the most appropriate way to set up a sell side process. Uh, for our typical clients. I think the first thing that you always have to think about before negotiating substance is understanding process and how can you create leverage and how does leverage work between the buy side and the sell side. And there are a couple key ingredients to leverage. You know, one being necessity, right? Do you, are you a forced seller? If you're a forced seller, you're in a bad situation. Most people um, don't find themselves in that position. You know, they'd like to sell, but they're under no compulsion to sell. The other ingredient is desire, both on the buy side and the sell side. 
you know, most sellers desire to sell and buyers, if they're having discussions with you, desire to buy. But there's often a disparity of, of who wants that asset more. So understanding desire on the sell side versus desire on the buy side is an important ingredient leverage. Other important ingredients, and I think by far the most important, is that of competition. Whenever you have a unique asset and you can increase the number of potential buyers in the process, you lift the price. And so when you think about this, you should be focused on running what we call an auction. And when you're running an auction, really on the sell side, my job is to be a process setter. So I'm setting the process by which the buyers will bid to acquire the asset. And auctions are not plain vanilla. There are controlled auctions, which are very formal. There are open bid auctions where you know, prices disclosed to everyone. There are closed bid private auctions, there are quasi auctions, there's modified auctions. There's a lot of different ways to auction an asset. So as a deal maker, understanding the assets that is for sale and understanding the buyer universe and using professional judgment gained over decades of experience allow you to set the most appropriate process to sell that business. And you know, when I look at any sell side process, a typical plain vanilla auction process at Potomac, you know, there's negotiations going on across the table. So between us, the sell side and the buyers, but there's also same side of the table negotiations whereby buyers are competing amongst themselves for an asset. Today, we're gonna to talk about, I think, largely the modified auction, which is probably 60 or 70 percent of the transactions that we do are kind of hybrid modified auctions whereby there's no asking price on a business the business is taken out the market and there are clear process rules in order to participate as a buyer you need to understand where the finish line is no one wants to negotiate one of the most frustrating things on the planet is negotiating with somebody on the other side of the table who just never stops negotiating right like where is the finish line how long are we going to continue to negotiate? Is the buyer always going to want more? Is the seller always going to want more? We never really come to a conclusion. So setting process rules and showing the buyers the finish line and telling them specifically how they get to that finish line allows us to do a, a few things. First off, by laying out a defined process rules that are very clear buyers aren't holding back you know you can take a race for example right you know let's say that you've got a uh, you know a marathon you watch the boston marathon it's, it's always in the, the last five or ten minutes that all of the runners are now sprinting to the finish line if you go to a race and there's no finish line and somebody shoots off the gun you don't know at what point you need to start sprinting you don't know who's going to win is it just the last guy standing so I think it's very important to set clear process rules. And most of our clients, when they come into this whole process, don't really understand that a sell side process is really one in which it's an auction process. Quite frankly, there's no other way to say it. There's no asking price on a business. Materials go out into the market and acquirers have to bid and we use closed bid processes, so no buyer knows what another buyer is bidding. And the whole goal, at least at the very front end of the process, is not to find ourselves negotiating directly with any specific acquirer. You wanna have, ideally, at minimum, six buyers in a process. Um, I think when you start getting north of 12 to 15, it starts to get cumbersome. But if you can shoot for a high single-digit number of buyers in a process, you will likely get enough demand that will ultimately force up the price. And my job is, is multifaceted. My first job is to make sure that I conceal as much information as possible on my side of the table. So being on the sell side, what I try to focus on is not having sellers reveal too much information that might cause the buy side to get leverage. So for example, if you want to sell a business and you call up an acquirer, 
one-on-one -on -one between you, the seller, and me being the buyer, for example, it's pretty easy for me to understand, okay, this guy really has a high degree of desire to sell because he's calling me all the time, he's emailing me. I told him I'd take a look at some materials, maybe get back to him with an offer. I might be a little bit slow in getting back to him and he's calling looking for the offer. So, you know, I can judge desire. You know, sellers often will talk about large big ticket purchases that they're gonna make. One of the reasons why I'm selling this business is I'm buying a ranch in Utah, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. We wanna conceal as much of that information as we possibly can because we don't want the other side, we don't want the buyers to really understand level of desire and necessity. In addition to concealing information, one of the other things that is extremely important is trying to ferret out as much information as we possibly can to help us in negotiation. So, for example, when we meet with buyers in a process, we want them to do the extreme majority of the talking. And there's a lot of things that I think are counterintuitive where, you know, when I sit down with acquisition meetings or just the conversations that I have with buyers all the time, I'm trying to understand what sort of quarter they're having, what sort of year they're having, what sort of strategic initiatives are going on behind the scenes, because there's multiple examples that I've talked about over the years on the boardroom buzz where we've sold businesses at prices that were substantially higher than what they should have otherwise garnered because we knew a, a company was having a bad quarter and needed to cover up some organic growth issues. And so they were gonna do a big acquisition. And when we understand the decision-making structure and the incentives of the people behind the scenes at the target, we can definitely use that to our favor. So we wanna ferret out information, understand as much about the individuals who are doing the transactions, what their personal career aspirations are, how they get compensated. We want to understand those things. We want to understand if the M&A guy is actually getting paid to commit capital, right? If he's getting paid as a percentage of EBITDA or as a percentage of total committed capital, now I've got somebody on the other side of the table from me that has a very, very strong incentive to do a particular deal. So understanding the decision-making structure and ferreting out as much information as possible is extremely important in the early stages of the negotiation. And quite frankly, having my client say the least amount as possible. I mean, always be very kind, always be very courteous, but do far more listening than talking. The other aspect of a, an appropriate sell side process is to have deadlines, right? When you think about union negotiations, 90% you know, of progress is made within an hour prior to strike where both sides have pretty adverse consequences. So we expect that in any sort of formal sell side process, the majority of the con concessions take place at the end. And it's not a union negotiation, right? There's no collective bargaining agreement. We don't have a strike deadline. We have to actually impose a deadline. So using deadlines allow us to corral buyers into making decisions simultaneously. Let's say that we started with 10 buyers, we did it round one. So what does that mean? That means round one bids are due at Thursday at 5 p.m. Okay. We receive our first offers. We've done ourselves a favor because we're getting all of our offers simultaneously. So we don't have a bird in the hand versus two in the bush. We're not doing things sequentially, we're doing everything in parallel. So now we have five offers on the table and we're able to look at them and compare them, right? And when you're looking at something side by side, it's very easy to compare and contrast. So now we've got these five bids. As we go into round two, we're gonna ask the acquirers to revise their bids forward. So we want more money from every one of them and we're gonna you know, systematically eliminate them from process. But by imposing specific deadlines, we're requiring the other side to act in a formal process where the deadline doesn't impact us in any way, shape or form. And the teeth behind that deadline is if you don't provide your bid by such and such a date, you're eliminated from process. So if they don't get it in, you know, and, and quite frankly, in the deal world, things happen, right? There's investment committees, there's bosses that travel, there's folks that have to approve it. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It's not in by five, you're completely out of the process. We definitely discipline repeat offenders in this matter, but 
Either way, it puts us in the sell side in a position where we're not waiting a, a week or two weeks for an offer. Deadline's on a Wednesday, we get them on Wednesday, we might get them on Thursday, but we're not waiting a week or two and we're certainly not calling and tracking down the buyer looking for them. So, that is using deadlines or using the concept of time to our advantage. Remember, a deadline that impacts the other side of the table that does not impact us helps us from a leverage perspective. So as we go through this whole sell side process, it's important, I think, for sellers to understand a few things. First off, perception really is reality in a sell side process. Whether you're negotiating with multiple buyers or whether you're negotiating with one, if you feel that you are strong, if you feel that your position is strong and you're confident in your position, in a lot of ways you are because you know, I find that humans don't, in anything in life and acutely in negotiations, you know, we don't really see the world as it is. We effectively see the world as we are and as our brain is interpreting the events. Sellers who don't do this every day tend to read into things that really quite frankly are, are not there. So it's important to think about the fact that when you go into a sell side process, it is gathering information, it is concealing information, and it is really trying to alter the perception of the other side. And let me give you some examples of that. In my life, multiple times, I've been in a formal sell side process where materials go out to buyers, I get no bids except for one acquire. Now, if that acquirer realized that there was in effect a busted auction, there were no other bidders in this process. It was just them, I would have lost a tremendous amount of leverage. But if the process continues to move sequentially, if folks are required to revise bids, even though there's only one buyer into the mix, it, it can alter the perception of that buyer that it is a competitive process. And sometimes you think if I'm too hard on this one buyer and I push him too far, I lose this buyer, I have no buyer. So your gut instinct is to handle him, handle this acquirer more delicately because you don't want to run him off. The flip side of that though is that that's not what you would do if you had a strong hand, right? If you had a strong hand, you might even double down and push him harder. And so the natural inclination of a seller would be, I've got a high desire to sell, I've only ha I only have one buyer, so I need to really relax a little bit, not negotiate as hard because I don't want to scare him off. The actual right thing to do more times than not in that situation is flip the script entirely and be more difficult with that buyer because that's exactly what you would do if you had a very, very strong hand. Now, judgment comes into play here, right? I mean, you really have to judge how badly that buyer wants that asset. And if you've done your job correctly and you're looking at indicia of desire as you go through the process, you'll understand how committed. Maybe they need to buy the asset. Maybe they really want to buy the asset. Maybe they need to plug a hole in a P&L. Maybe they're, maybe they're buying another business in an adjoining city or state from where you are and combining those two would create a lot of value. If you've kept your mouth closed and done a lot of listening, you'll know that. So when the time comes and there's only one buyer, you know exactly how to deal with that buyer. So the most important aspect of a sell side process right out of the gate is setting a process because it is a process. I've said this multiple times, there's no objective price on a business. It's subjective. It's based on the subjective judgments of acquire. So setting the process and, and also being nimble and having judgment to be able to change process rules as you go along as, as circumstances change. You know, if we were in a process and went through three rounds of bidding and then I lost every acquirer but one, I would have to use professional judgment in order to determine how I may or may not change that process. So having judgment built up by decades of experience is of course extremely important in how to make game time decisions in a process. But if you do nothing else and, and set a process, you are gonna be in a substantially better place than 
your peers out there because you know most business owners don't really understand this and and usually when when a seller wants to sell a business the first thing they think about is who is the most likely buyer you know a lot of times if you take the pest control industry for example you know you might size up your business and say well I don't want to sell to Terminex, I don't want to sell to Orkin, I don't know Renekill, I don't know Anti-CMX, but I know the Aero folks, or I know the Massey folks. And I think that that would be a good match for my business. When you fall in love with any sort of buyer prior to commencing process, you're ceding leverage to that particular buyer. So whenever I think about a sell side process, I always tell our clients, we have to go into this from an agnostic perspective of, we don't care ultimately who ends up buying it. Now, at some point we will, but we need the cards to be all on the table before we start making this objective judgment that this acquirer is a better match than that acquirer. And I think it's a very, very important thing to do. I think another big mistake that, that sellers make is they don't understand in auction dynamics what one extra bidder can do on the margin to a process. You know, sometimes you run an auction and you get to the very end and you might have three bidders out there and there's a very narrow delta between all of their offers, right? It might be very, very narrow. But sometimes if you've run an auction well and you've negotiated process and substance throughout and you've done a stellar job, sometimes you can find yourself at the end where you've got three bidders and one bidder is just materially above everyone else. And so when I talk to a lot of sellers over the years who have either sold their businesses on their own or used guys that really have no business advising sellers, you know, one of the things that typically strikes me is that, number one, they didn't include enough participants in the buyer universe. Number two, they didn't run a formal process. I mean, they basically just put some materials together, threw it out the door and see what, what sticks. And it's really hard to, it's really hard to take back discussions that you've had. And, and here's what I mean by that. When we run a controlled auction, for example, it's controlled and we really limit the flow of information that goes out at each stage of the process in order to protect the seller and also to protect the integrity of the auction process and at the end of the day i get paid based upon what my clients put in their pocket so i have every incentive in the world to blow past targets so when i think about a, a sell side process for me it's this Step number one, I assess the asset. What is it I'm selling? Step number two, I determine who the appropriate buyer universe is, and then I try to expand on it. And I never, ever make assumptions as to what a buyer may or may not do. Sellers always say, Paul, who do you think will buy my business? I say, I don't know, I do this every day of the week and 50% of the time I'm wrong. And that's exactly what I should be. I should be wrong because if I'm doing my job right, the buyer universe is expansive enough so that I'm never making assumptions as to what a particular buyer may or may not do. I want them to be in this process and I want them to demonstrate what they're gonna do by putting those numbers on a piece of paper. So that second mistake is not really, you know, it's a failure of imagination in determining what the acquisition universe should be. And you know, a lot of times when you get into specialized industries like HVAC and lawn care and pest control, you'll have, the standard business broker out there will largely go to the strategic acquirers, right? They might throw a few financial sponsors, private equity firms into the mix, but they often won't get creative and go to allied industries. And, you know, the reality is oftentimes folks in allied industries might not be the best buyer from a fit perspective for your business. Having particular financial sponsors that you really don't want to do business with might not necessarily be the best buyers. But when I'm thinking about a controlled auction process or a modified auction, really what I, all I'm thinking about is terms and price. How do I ratchet this up? How can I use a buyer that I don't want to do business with to jack up the price, right? And, and I find that in at least 25% of the processes I run, 
I am using buyers that I have zero interest in doing, or the client has zero interest in selling to, to jack up the price on the buyers that we ultimately want to sell to. Even though we use those other buyers to jack up the price, in rare occasions we end up selling to them because the offer is you know, literally an offer we couldn't refuse. So it's important to not fail in using the imagination when determining your, your acquisition universe. And I know that sellers by their very nature are concerned about confidentiality and rightfully so. You should be extremely concerned about confidentiality. You should keep the sell side process extremely limited um, with regard to who knows about it. Right? You don't wanna tell your team. I, I know there's some sellers who like to be open. But while you're going through a sell side process, it really should be the smallest amount of people possible on a need to know basis only. Sellers often get worried, well, if I bring in a big enough acquisition universe, a lot of people are gonna know about this. They're gonna steal my intellectual property and proprietary processes. They're gonna know them for sale. My competitors are gonna use that. Look, small competitors will. If you've got a decent sized business, you're gonna focus on acquirers that have the capacity to pay and the willingness to pay, and that's often not small and regional companies. And those are the guys that are most likely to use this against you. you know, big national players or large companies with deep pockets that are in the business of making acquisitions are often pleasant to deal with. And the chances of them blowing through confidentiality is extremely rare. You know, I, I see it maybe, you know, last year I think we did 54 transactions. I think I saw confidentiality get blown once and it was addressed very quickly and wasn't a problem. So I, I don't worry so much about that from the standpoint of I wouldn't necessarily limit the acquisition universe solely based upon some unwarranted concern about confidentiality. When I think about the psychology of transactions, you know, when I talked before on the counterintuitive nature of M&A, um, you know, we talked about the importance of being likable, right? And, you know, you've got executives who will be ultimately writing you a very, very big check. And, you know, you sell a business for $50 million, that's far more than these people make. And so the last thing you wanna do is be a jackass that they're writing a $50 million check to. You want to be somebody that's likable. And if you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of ever negotiating with one buyer in almost a positional bargaining situation, you have to understand that there's a certain acquisition mating dance that takes place. And you have an asking price in your mind. Let's use an example. You want $25 million for your business. This buyer wants to pay you 15. So there's a $10 million spread there. You know, in a positional bargaining situation, you're effectively going back and forth tit for tat. And it's important to realize that whether it's a controlled auction or it's a one-on-one -on -one negotiation that concessions really need to be earned. You know, I have watched this for decades and every year it rings more and more true to me is that if the other side doesn't expend effort and energy to get something, they're not gonna value it. So if I were to ask you to concede to something and it's not that important to you and you concede it relatively quickly, I haven't really expended much energy to get that. I'm not gonna value it much. I'm not saying that um, every time you make a concession, you have to yell and scream and cry and rant and rave and make them feel like, you know, they're, they're pulling it out of your hide. But at the end of the day, you, you need to make sure that the other side works for it. And it's the same thing on, you know, for buyers, it's, it amazes me sometimes that, you know, I'll go into a process and, you know, a seller wants, $20 million for a business and a, a buyer really wants to buy it. And we very quickly get to that $20 million mark. Now, the seller should be ecstatic. He's getting the 20 million he wants, but he really didn't have to work for it. And so he's always going to want to negotiate more. So when you find yourself in, in a bargaining situation, you gotta remember that concessions, of course, take place over time. 
there's more concessions later in the process. And the size of concessions is a signaling mechanism, right? So in the beginning of a process, you can make a larger concessions. Uh, like, so for example, let's go back to the positional bargaining situation. I want 25 million, a buyer wants to pay 15 million. Now we end up somewhere in that zone. On the buy side, you might move in million dollar increments on price early in the process, right? You might move on $5 million increments. But by the time we get towards the end of a process, whether it's a one-off negotiation or it's a controlled process, you have to signal on the buy side by decreasing the increments by which you move. So on a $25 million deal at the very end, if I'm a buyer, I might be moving at $100,000 increments or $50,000 increments, whereas two rounds ago, I was moving at a million dollar increments. And, and that's a signaling process. That's a signaling process from the buy side, right? As we go through iterative rounds, the improvement on price gets smaller and smaller. You know, the same thing goes for sellers though, right? You should be willing to bargain the things that you're least concerned about towards the beginning. You should be more willing to give those away in exchange, right? Quid pro quo for something else. And this mating dance of give and take over time, as you start to get closer and closer to the end and what you ultimately are willing to do, what you're willing to give should be less and less and less. And it should get significantly more difficult to extract those concessions from you, again, as a signaling process that we're getting towards the end of the road. Back to what I was discussing a minute ago, I've seen, you know, acquirers move very quickly in large increments and, and basically give it all the way up front. And oftentimes it's better to, let, let's say I'm willing to move $5 million on price. Well, I don't go from 15 to 20 million and say, that's it, this is my best and final. That's not a good position to be in because the seller will always believe that there's more. But if I'm willing to move $5 million, you know, I might start at 2 million at first, and then a million, then 500,000, then 200,000, and move in very, very, very small increments and really make that seller work for it. It never ceases to amaze me when I see this sort of activity. And sometimes, you know, I listen to acquirers telling me, hey, we're coming towards the end here, but I'm gonna give I'm going to move on price X amount. On the one hand, I'm happy because they've moved a, a significant amount. On the other hand, I'm just like, I, I don't understand what you're doing because now what you've effectively done is you've signaled to a seller who has never been through one of these processes that you've got a lot in your pocket and you're willing to move in, in big chunks. So again, it's important to make the other side work very hard for concessions because it's human nature to not value what you haven't worked for. If I've learned anything over the years, I've learned that, again, back to perception is reality. A lot of times, I think we tend to understate our strength in a process and sometimes overstate the strength of a of our adversary, uh, of, of the person on the other side of the table from us. And really the best thing that you can do on the sell side is get the buy side's imagination to really run wild, right? If, if I've only got one or two bidders, I want them to think there's 10 or 15. I want them to think this company is going to do something crazy or that company is going to do something crazy. The more I say will only hurt my causes. It'll only hurt my purpose. The less I say allows the imagination on the other side of the table to run <laughs> to run wild. And, and I see it, I've seen it play out for decades. So look, I guess in summary of this particular topic, you don't ever wanna be in a position to lie, number one. You don't ever wanna even be in a position to talk about other bids, you don't. You wanna let strength speak for itself because really, you know, it, it's the negotiations and the threats that actually are displays of weakness subconsciously. The quieter that you are, the more confidence you are, confident you are in your process, the least you say you will exude strength. And I know that seems counterintuitive. It clearly must be because 99% of sellers take the exact opposite approach, right? You know, and again, I've talked about this before where they say, I'm not giving my business away. I've got a lot of options. Well, no shit. 
Like we realize you have a lot of options. You have a valuable asset. You're not running your process right. And you're going to end up leaving money on the table. And I see it all the time. And quite frankly, I'm happy sometimes, certainly not when our clients do, but I look around the industry and it, and it kind of excites me. I just saw a, I saw a deal that was done earlier this year where a seller left a good $25 million on the table. And, you know, I came to find out after the deal that, you know, he kept threatening, hey, I'm going to give me what I want. Otherwise, I'm going to call Potomac. And he went through this kind of one-off negotiation with one buyer. And at the end of the day, when, you know, the deal was done and I learned what the price was for, I thought to myself, well, that was $25 million left on a table because the seller, of course, was extremely confident in his ability to negotiate um, and to make threats with the buyer. And of course, buyers are professional buyers, right? You do maybe one or two deals in your whole life uh, of this scale. A lot of these other guys do this 20, 30, 40 times a year. So you tend to learn this over time. And a lot of the acquirers in the industries in which I work they're typically publicly traded companies or large private equity backed firms. They do a great job in shielding decision makers. And here's what I mean by that. When you're negotiating with rent -a -Kill, you're often not negotiating directly across the table from Andy Ransom, the CEO, or John Myers, for example, the North American president. These guys are in the background. They've got their team out there doing the negotiations. And at the end of the day, the folks that are negotiating for them, uh, their employees are run a kill, they're not the ultimate decision makers, right? They have to seek approval. There's investment committees, there's boards of directors, there's senior executives that ultimately approve material transactions. So you're never really sitting across the table from a real decision maker. And the farther somebody is from the negotiating table, the more difficult they can be, right? I mean, it's easy to sit back here in a smoke-filled lounge and say, you know what? do this, don't do that, I'm not giving on this point, go into the bargaining table and get it done. It, it's easy to do that when you're sitting far away from the table. When you're negotiating for yourself, you know, and the other side knows that you're the decision maker. And they know that everything that you say at the table, you're either gonna have to commit to, or you're gonna have to backtrack from, which puts you in a very, very difficult spot. So that's why I always say like, it, it really makes sense for you as a seller to never, ever, ever get into any sort of direct negotiation with the other side. And when you do that, more likely than not, you're actually guaranteeing yourself that you will get a less attractive deal. And I see it over and over again, because first off, you're emotionally attached to the business. That's part of your ego, your identity's tied to it you have a lot of concern for your employees. And of course, this is a large transaction, so you're concerned about the money. When you're in very tense negotiation situations, you yourself, of course, don't wanna lose the deal. And so you get nervous and you can undercut yourself. When you're sitting face to face with the other side, it's really easy to read in on, on somebody's face. When I'm sitting at a table with a professional negotiator who can look at me and say, Paul, I, you know, this sounds reasonable. The boss is probably going to say it's a bunch of shit, but you know, look, we'll have a talk about it. Or I can say the same thing, like, look, I don't like what you put on the table. I don't think it's going to fly, but I'll have a conversation and we'll come back to this. It's easy to trial balloon things when two non-decision makers are sitting at a table. If you're sitting at the table, you look at the other guy as he's telling you that this is bullshit. It, it can be red on your face. So again, if you wanna do this right, you engage somebody who has spent his or her entire career negotiating process and substance. If you're not gonna do that, at bare minimum, at bare minimum, find somebody who's not you. Anyone who's not related to you and related to the business to negotiate on your behalf, and I guarantee you will do better because you are the worst negotiator on your own behalf. I don't negotiate anything anymore at all. 
I don't go and negotiate my own purchase of a car. Any sort of big ticket item, I'm not the one who negotiates for myself. I, I never do it anymore, period. Nothing in life, any sort of acquisition I'm gonna make or a purchase, I have somebody do it on my behalf. Because I know that we're all the worst negotiators when we negotiate on our own behalf. It's a lot easier to negotiate on somebody else's behalf. So I think if you take anything away from that, when you do get into negotiations, whether it is on the purchase or sale of a business, a piece of real property, whether it's a material joint alliance or anything that you do in business, resist the urge to be negotiator in chief on your own behalf. Find somebody that can do it in your stead. I appreciate you joining me today and look forward to seeing you again.